everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I'm very excited to interview tonight's special guest, Dr. Richard Openlander. He is the author of the groundbreaking book, Food Choice and Sustainability. Dr. Openlander is a consultant and researcher whose award-winning book, Comfortably Unaware, has been endorsed as a must-read by Ellen DeGeneres, Dr. Jane Goodall, and Dr. Neil Barnard, among many others. Dr. Oppenlander is a much sought after lecturer and has been a keynote speaker for several conferences and events and has presented lectures and workshops at numerous universities and corporations. So please welcome to the show, Dr. Oppenlander. Hey, thanks so much for being here. Well, certainly a privilege. What a, what a marvelous introduction. Thanks so much. Before we begin, I wanted to thank you for all, all that you're doing uh, oh, about food choice and health. It's just wonderful for me to see this. Well, thank you. You know, I, and I'm not just saying this because you're my guest, because I, if you know anything about astrology, I'm an Aries, and I don't need to blow smoke up your butt. I'm going to say what I'm going to say is the truth. So as you know, I'm the creator of an event called Healthy Taste of LA, and I'm one of the co-producers, and we've produced 13 of them. And I have to say that the lecture you gave, is either the best lecture I've ever heard or or one of the top lectures because not not just that you're a good lecturer you are you're a great lecturer but the subject of your talk should be seen it should be on television it should be on everyone should see that talk because a lot of us specialize you know they always say the riches and or in the niches and a lot of us in the plant based movement have found our own little you know unique voice in the area we do but your talk Dr Openlander was so comprehensive because it it hit everything. It hit all the notes. It talked about human health and animal health and welfare, the health of the planet, the environment. I've never seen it, you know, wound together the way you did that. It's it's brilliant. And and I don't know why, like, this isn't on TV every day. It's so good what you do. So thank you. Well, thank you for all that. It's really true. And whether, whether the words came from me or whether they come from somebody else, you're exactly right. The topic is 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 critical actually it's critical to that to the correct definition of that word sustainable i mean if we don't you know if we don't get things put together correctly and everything is connected just as you said then you know the, our survival as a species is in question when did you become so passionate about this cause like like cuz uh, up until i got your book comfortably aware a few years ago by Linda Middlesworth, your biggest fan. I have not heard of you. And so what drove your passion for this? You know, you, I know you're a doctor, and how did you get into this whole, you know, movement, so to speak? Well, I do want to say Linda is wonderful. <laughs> Linda is definitely <laughs> yeah. wonderful. So, uh, more of your I, books than anybody, I think. I, I can't say enough about her. And uh, so, anyway, yeah, t- uh, Basically, the summary of all that is is that I, I was introduced to this more on a cellular level, on a nutritional cellular level, when I was doing some medical research back in uh, 40, maybe 40, 42 years ago. And then it evolved into um, seeing what was occurring behind the scenes uh, from uh, the production of food, especially animal agriculture, as compared to plant-based uh, agriculture and what it took, uh, what resources it took, and how inefficient it was to produce animal agriculture uh, and their products, and to get the products on our plate. And we also, I happened to um, marry just an incredible person who brought more of a uh, animal uh, welfare and uh, compassion aspect into my life. So it really did. It wound everything together quite quite nicely. That's fantastic. Well, I always wonder how people think of titles for their book, because I think the title of a book is so important. How did you come up with the title, Comfortably Unaware? Such a great title. <laughs> well, actually, it fits very well, doesn't it? I mean, well, you know, yeah. after, yeah, I mean, after uh, so many years of researching and, and uh, attempting to to uh, to get the word out about this topic, especially how it affects our environment, all the different threading that you mentioned earlier from food choice to all the different areas of uh, efficiencies regarding resources. It just it became quite apparent that there's so many different uh, influences that we have around us that have made made the, those in, in positions that can do something about it um, either unaware or bound by cultural influences. And so I think that, you know, we've all become a bit complacent in the fact that our, everything that we do every day has an effect on something else, but not so profoundly as important as our food choice. It has such global impact, and so I think that all of us, uh, the most important thing we can do is become aware, and then I mm-hmm. think uh, I think it'll make great change in the world. Do you think that most people are truly unaware, or they just don't care, or maybe a little bit of both? 
Well, you have to look at different levels. Uh, first of all, and it's a very complicated topic, but I can tell you this, that uh, the, the global uh, population in terms of individuals are mostly unaware. Uh, mm -hmm. They want to do something about our environment in terms of climate change, and they certainly don't want to run out of resources. I mean, nobody does. Everybody would want to survive, and especially looking at future generations, but they just aren't aware. Those that are aware are bound by, as I said, cultural influences and constraints, especially those of influence that, that can bring awareness to others, either through the media or, or uh, policymakers, uh, especially on an international basis. It's just too tough of a topic, and yet isn't that strange because it's the topic that's going to uh, make or break our survival. Yeah, yeah. Do you think the, that the fact that so many people make so much money from doing things that are harming the planet has anything to do with the fact that maybe they don't want everybody to know how bad some of these choices are? Yeah, certainly. I mean, you hit it right on the nose. I mean, it, it will sooner or later become an, an e a fully economic issue. And some businesses, uh, some international businesses are realizing this. I think, Chef AJ, the issue is this, is that everybody in the world and all corporate uh, corporate corporate responsibility statements today have that word sustainable mentioned somewhere. You just can't survive as an institution without at least bringing it to the forefront that you're concerned about sustainability. The issue is how it's defined. It's mm -hmm. ill-defined. Ill it's, it's rarely, if ever, connected to food choice, and it's never connected properly. And so until that happens, and that's, I guess, my point, it comes back to the original question of why I'm so passionate about this is, is because, I mean, I have a lot of other things to do. I kept thinking somebody else would bring this to the <laughs> forefront, you know. I mean, <laughs> and, and, then, and then realizing that nobody really is. In fact, we're going in the other direction, you know, with what Michael Pollan's saying and those proponents of grass-fed and local and all these other, uh, all these other uh, move, food movements that, as you know, aren't healthy if they have animal agriculture at the, at the uh, nucleus. Right, exactly. What is global depletion exactly, and do you feel it can be avoided? Mm -hmm. Well, my definition of global depletion is what we're losing is sort of a twist in the other direction on sustainability. Since, I, as I mentioned, the word sustainable is so ill-defined and yet it's ubiquitous, it's found everywhere, I felt the better way to approach this in more of a quantitative fashion or qualitative fashion even is is by using the word depletion what are we what are we running out of it may seem a little bit negative but it actually puts the correct framing on our resources what what are we running out of and global depletion are uh, the main categories are those that sustain us such as fresh water land use there's land use inefficiencies that abound uh, livestock right now occupy 45 percent of all the land mass ice-free terrestrial land mass on earth they are using about 27% of all the fresh water drawn on Earth. And so those are things that are being depleted, um, as well as uh, we can also talk about uh, biodiversity, loss of biodiversity with one to 10,000 times loss of quicker rate of loss than we've ever seen in the history of our planet. And most of that, again, 30 to 50 percent can be directly attributed to uh, livestock and animal agriculture. So these are some of the areas of depletion. Uh, we can't leave out oceanic uh, ecosystems as well, because as as one of the food movements, as you well know, is it, it becoming more and more commonly heard, is eating less meat, the meatless Mondays yeah. and things like that. But this is very, very dangerous because it's subjective. And when you think about it, it's placing us in sort of a pseudo-sustainable uh, mode because we really need to uh, use our resources in the most efficient manner possible, the most optimal way, and the most optimal way uh, is by using only plant-based foods. Mm -hmm. When did human beings get this insatiable appetite for animal flesh? <laughs> well, I mean, that goes back to primitive times. In fact, I often say that, you know, we, we don't live in primitive times anymore, and so we have to evolve, and part of, part of our evolution is to get away from those things that are harmful to us, those around us, uh, and those meaning around us, meaning all, all, all species, all, everything that's living on Earth, these are all interconnected. So, I mean, it, it occurred, obviously, when probably 50,000 years ago, but what we have to do is get out of our loincloths in terms of eating uh, behavior and say to ourselves, okay, we're running out of finite uh, resources. There, there just isn't enough resources. There's not enough resources on Earth to support uh, 7.2 billion people. In addition to that, they're project projected to be 9.6 billion people by the year 2050. And that's wow. also the time that uh, livestock, 
uh, operations are predicted to have to double the, in terms of doubling our meat and dairy intake by then to produce this. And as I said, it's the most inefficient way to use our resources right now. So it really, it really doesn't make any sense. So we have to evolve. If, if we're going to evolve as a species, we have to do things that kind of make sense, especially not only for us, but we have to start looking outside of ourself, outside of self, because future generations are counting on us. You know, they're going to look back and say, "This is the generation that where we could make, where they could make or break, you know, the the the, the earth and the planet and the resources for us that are struggling now." How do we wake people up, Doctor Openlander? I mean, not every, unfortunately, not everybody's read your book or seen your lecture. They should, mm-hmm. but they haven't. Mm-hmm. No. No, you're right, and I think all of us, it's inherent in all of us to, to become as aware as possible and to find those sources like everything that you're doing and, and all those that you're connected with, all the Dr. McDougall's and Ornish's and mm-hmm. Barnard's and, you know, all, all the things that uh, Linda Middlesworth is involved with. You know, she's a classic example. I mean, uh, she, she's gone way out of her way to inspire others, Just and, and everybody can, can be like her, and everybody yeah. can, can, can do these things. They can grasp uh, the the, the mo- most amount of awareness they have around them and then act upon it by inspiring others. And also it's time to start getting on board with political um, uh, uh, influence. You need to in- influence your legislators, especially in places like California where water res- fresh water resources that are, are, are becoming such a, such a topic. And, uh, you know, while, while they are so strong on on uh, creating uh, creating uh, fines for use of water, there, there little has been done to con- make the con- proper connection between their water footprint and uh, animal agriculture, which is really using 50 to 70 percent of all your water out there. Yeah. Oh boy. When did we start really becoming aware of global warming? Because it's it, you know I remember you know growing up in the 60s that wasn't a word that I ever heard. Mm-hmm. No, well, global warming is one of the one of the areas of global depletion, as you know. But that's that's just one, and that's the one that's at the forefront now, and it's fine. But the issue with global warming, it probably started back in the '80s, I think, with the testimony by uh, Hansen, Jim Hansen, the NASA scientist, mm-hmm. and uh, and then broadened as we be, as uh, the Kyoto uh, uh, summit happened, and now we have the Conference of the Parties that happens every year through the United Nations. So it's being watched real carefully. The problem with it is is that the, the onus has been placed uh, on, the, on the petroleum companies, the gas and oil and fossil fuel companies. So it appears, which, which is the primary uh, culprit for anthropogenic or human-induced greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, the next leading factor is animal agriculture. And uh, it's, so, so it, in, in fact, it's been estimated by a number of reputable scientists that if we don't uh, rein in uh, animal agriculture, it's expected that even if we dropped fossil fuels out completely, we cannot, we cannot, dro- we cannot drop greenhouse gas emissions to, to lower uh, our heating below the 2 degree centigrade mark that's, uh, that's been targeted as, uh, you know, beyond that, it's irreversible. So, so, so e- e- is each year this getting worse? Is it, it, yeah. it, it's just every it, year since this started, it's just getting worse and worse? It and is. Worse. What are the it, ramifications of this? It is well. I mean, we have to remember too that climate change is uh, is 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 well, a couple things about climate change. I mean, climate change is not caused by uh, just driving your car around. I mean, there are a number of different factors, and as I said, one of the most important things we could possibly do is look what's on our plate. And yeah. anything to do with animal agriculture has to be dropped out completely because it's the leading cause of of uh, of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, mm-hmm. uh, from food production, and it is getting worse each year. A lot of it is because of our fossil fuel use, but as I said, uh, there are so many different aspects to food production in terms of deforestation of, of uh, tropical rainforest to produce to produce food, mostly mostly soy for uh, livestock animals, and so up to 70 to 80 percent of the Amazon has been destroyed because of livestock and crops to feed them, and they are the lungs along with our oceans of our planet. So if you start reducing those, it's not just greenhouse gas emissions by by vehicles. It's in fact um, animal agriculture produces more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation sector uh, uh, alone. Right. So instead of getting a Prius, 
go vegan. <laughs> oh, there's no question about that. It's it's a it's a band aid to get a Prius if you know if you're if you're still eating meat. And yes, to answer your question a little bit better, it is it is uh, it is becoming worse each year. Even though there have been pledges by various countries, one of the reasons is is because the the uh, the focus has been on fossil fuels, as I said. And it's only been last year where it was the first year that uh, there's been an inter- introduction of anything to do with animal agriculture properly, and it's still not being addressed correctly. So, and many, as I said, many scientists now uh, are, are aware that that even if we drop fossil fuels all completely, we're still not going to get below uh, the threshold we need by the year 2030 uh, to 2050. So what's going to happen? Are we just, is this going to get so hot that we're not going to be able? I mean, like really, how do, what do you think is going well, to? Happen? Well, climate change is an exacerbator of. We're, we we already have weather patterns that happen, as you know, severe weather patterns. But but climate change is is an exacerbator. It takes uh, thunderstorms and and uh, and uh, and rain and, and and sea rises and makes them all all worse. And so uh, things will still happen, but it's going to get to the point where it's irreversible and they're going to get out of control. And that's been predicted if our, if our uh, temperature of our planet raises higher than 2 degrees centigrade. And it's already at about 1.5, and there are many factors uh, related to that, as I said, with continued animal agriculture expected to be to double by the year 2050 that's just going to uh, take it over that mount. So, yeah, it'll probably get worse. We can, we can halt all this. Uh, at least do the easiest thing you could possibly do is just change out what's on your plate. Right. It's gonna it's gonna stop. You know, if you think about it, it's gonna stop the unnecessary fossil fuel use within that industry. It's also gonna create uh, a, a much larger mitigation effect because uh, growing plants and restoring lands that have been ruined from animal agriculture and including our rainforests are all gonna come back. Our oceans will be restored as well. A lot of that has to do with efficiencies. I mean, you can grow. 15 times more protein on an acre of land than you can, or on any area of land, uh, compare with plants compared to animal products. It's just mm-hmm. in, very inefficient use of our land right now. You said that the rainforest is the lungs of the planet, and over 70 percent has been destroyed. The people that live there, how how did they let it happen? I mean, I'm over here. If, I mean, I would have mm-hmm. tied myself to the tree. How did they allow that to happen? In well, great, great question, but it's the underlying problem of, uh, of politics. Uh, the, the industries that, that basically govern, uh, govern the world right now are one of the major, major sectors are our food production. And there are only a few uh, large international conglomerate uh, businesses that actually drive uh, not only uh, not only the seed uh, such as Monsanto, uh, but also uh, the futures uh, in, in terms of ADM and cargo, but also the end product. There are only a few companies that control over 70 to 80 percent of the end animal product, and so they're driving uh, through through political manipulation. They drive uh, resource use, especially land use, in the Amazon, and now they're going to be doing it. It's where I'm working on a world hunger project in Mozambique right now, and now they're driving the use of uh, sub. Sub-Saharan countries for animal agriculture. It's very sad because livestock is the primary cause of resource, of resource depletion in those countries. So as as the population grows to the year 2050, these larger conglomerate uh, businesses, international, multinational co- companies, are going to be driving uh, resource use through uh, these countries that have little to to uh, afford. You know, there are already in Ethiopia, for instance, more than 40 percent are hunger hungry and starving. And yet they have over 100 million uh, cattle and sheep and chickens that are using their land and water and food, and they've lost over two thirds of their topsoil. So, it's, and then they're just a that's just a, one example. So until global demand for meat drops substantially, we're going to see this continued abuse of of land that can ill afford it. And uh, and so and it and starts as you as you asked that very uh, poignant question before, it starts with all of us. You know, if all of us, I often said, if we stopped, I don't know what Twinkies is doing now, but if all of us stopped eating Twinkies, you know, today, or, or food like that, you better believe they wouldn't be made. So, uh, you know, there's a lot to do with, with subsidies and things like that, too. But we all are the start of what, of what, can, what can create just a huge, massive, uh, uh, critical change in the mass uh, in, uh, in public awareness. I just don't understand why they chose the, you know, the beautiful Amazon rainforest because now you're saying they're moving it to these other countries, but like, why there? Like, well, I mean, there's yeah. other places to raise cattle, isn't there, or to grow yep. soy? So yeah, yeah, exactly. No, you're exactly right. The soil is actually not fertile once it's once the, once the trees are cut down, and then it just creates micro uh, changes in microclimate. There's erosion. There's uh, uh, 
there's uh, desertification, and so the, the soil after you've cut down rain, you know 20,000 year old trees of uh, or rainforest areas are, is actually uh, poor, but but it's cheap, and that's well, that's why they're using it. It's very very cheap. Brazil is one of the top producers of of uh, livestock, and they have uh, and they have been for a while. Now they're producing soy, uh, and it's not just cattle. I mean they're producing soy that's now being uh, being moved to China to support over 60 percent of all the pigs. That are that are eaten and slaughtered in the world, and so China's becoming a very very large player in this. And China's running out of soil; they're running out of resources, and most of the re- natural resources they have have already been used up or polluted now because of their um, their uh, agricultural industry. They have one of the deepest aquifers that are becoming depleted, just like we have, uh, and they're uh, now turning to these other countries, just as you asked about the why they're turning to the tropical rainforest or sub-Saharan countries because it's cheap. It's cheaper for them, and these larger companies can go in and um, and create uh, political influences to those uh, other countries for and 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 it's a big money maker for them. I figured money had to do with it. It's so you sad. Know, it's really so sad. Um, so Al Gore, in his book The Inconvenient Truth, why did he not mention the meat or dairy or fishing industry? You think? Yeah. Well, it's a political loser. Uh, there's no question that. Uh, any anybody of influence with a platform right now that that mentions something that runs across the grain of uh, a, a huge cultural influence or huge cultural be- beliefs such as uh, meat and dairy industry within you know within various populations they're going to lose their audience and uh, and so it's much easier for him to to, to talk about the uh, energy industry and to how to how to swap out light bulbs than it is for somebody to do a makeover on their plate e- even though even though it is, you and I both know with with um, just some of the phenomenal recipes that you have out there and that others yeah. have you know you you can make you can make food uh, much more delicious and obviously sure. much more healthy for an individual so it's just a matter of placing that next connection to the environment and and nobody really wants to do that and so uh, you know that, that's why I can walk into a university and I'll have a couple thousand people listen to me. But I've just followed on the heels of Michael Pollan, who had maybe forty thousand people listening to mm-hmm. him, and that's because he's saying what they want to hear. He's saying eat less meat, uh, eat grass-fed meat, and and all those are unsustainable and it's unhealthy for our planet. But nobody really wants to hear that. Right. I, I just I still just don't get. You know, I've been vegan almost forty years, and I I mean like the Twinkies I can get. They taste. I mean I don't eat them, but you know they. I remember eating them. They were kind of good. I just don't get why. <laughs> People have such an insatiable appetite for animal flesh, you know, because by itself, you have to do something to it to make it taste good. Like if I eat an apple, I can make apple juice, applesauce, apple pie, dried apples, but all the, you know, an apple still tastes good, but you know, meat, if you just don't do anything to it, it it just tastes pretty disgusting. Mm -hmm. Well, you're you're exactly right. You know more about the taste preferences, you know, than just about anybody. And you're exactly right, though. It it is disgusting. And, uh, but... Uh, when you have all this influence behind you, I mean, I, I I just got back from, I mean, a couple of months ago, I got back from a large uh, uh, um, international workshop uh, in the UK where uh, I was speaking uh, against the eat less meat uh, uh, mantra, and uh, they just didn't want to hear it uh, to eat no meat because they have such a large dairy um, uh, concern there, and it's based on uh, ill-conceived precepts. I mean, so mm-hmm. so it's not only the taste preferences that we're we're battling here. It's the fact that uh, most political entities right now are 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 biased for the meat and dairy industries. Again, they're you know they're large lobby groups, and so most of our nutritional information is coming, as you know, from these groups. One thing I want to point out: it's been very positive to see the scientific committee for the USDA come out with a 517-page summary stating that they need to make recommendations. It comes up every five years, and they're going to make it to the USDA, uh, and which will eventually you know, move into all the public school systems uh, and, all, and all of our, all the public in America anyway, that we need to start um, addressing food choices because of our environment. It's, for, it's a historic, actually, but uh, because they're, they've, uh, they've advanced the, the uh, suggestion that uh, we shouldn't be eating meat. Uh, now, the problem is they can't say eliminate. Uh, they're going to be saying we need to eat less meat. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a real market step in the right direction. The difficulty with that is 
even though it's historic, and uh, and they're going to be battled by the meat and dairy industry. This just happened in February, but um, it's going to shift to uh, to eating fish because fish isn't oh, they're not related to meat in many people's minds. And and this oh. and, yeah no and this and this report didn't even address it correctly. So there, as I said at the onset, there's very inherent um, dangers in not eliminating things completely, or or if you want to be positive, more positive about it, just just finding alternatives, complete alternatives, completely to a, to a, you know or organically grown whole uh, plant-based diet, because they're going to be turning to uh, fish, which our oceans can can ill afford the loss of any more fish with with over a thousand species now uh, uh, depleted or overexploited. Mm. In fact, it's predicted that by the year 2058, and we're talking about tipping points. There's so many tipping points to all those areas of global depletion. It's not about when we get around to it. Yeah. Uh, it's really has to. Be, we have to look at the fact that the time is now because these tipping tipping points are becoming irreversible, and we're reaching many of them right now. Our oceans are predicted to be completely, at least 95 percent of all commercially viable fish are are predicted to become extinct by the year 2048. Oh my gosh! I'll be I'll be uh, I'll be 88. So. <laughs> 88 years young, and that's and, and that's the point, though. You know, if things are are becoming irreversible in our lifetime. We're we're the generations, the the, the various generations that live now. Uh, whether you're 15, 20, or 50, or 60, or 70, we're together in it right now. Where we're these tipping points of climate change, freshwater scarcity, our oceanic systems that they're all becoming irreversible, and and many, 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 many species are becoming extinct each year because of our choices, primarily because of food choice. You know, it's funny when you mention meat. You know, a lot of people say I don't eat meat, but they they don't consider chicken and fish meat. They consider it vegetables. They're not. But I remember that movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, where she said, "Well, Ian's a vegetarian. He doesn't eat meat." And the aunt goes, "Okay, we'll serve lamb." So why do you think that words like meat and protein are deceptive? Yeah, it's a really good point that you made. Um, well, first of all, everyone's still looking for the alternative uh, that is still right in front of them and isn't that large of a shift, and that also maintains somewhat of the the uh, myth that they've learned about about protein and and from the media and from uh, other sources about nutrition. So if they shift from red meat to First of all, all, all meat's red. You know that because uh, all, everything that lives, you know, all animals that live, all species have blood supply through them. So it's red no matter how you look at it. Yeah. Um, it's disgusting as well. Um, and and the process it takes to even even destroy life like that's ridiculous. But but that that aside, um, yeah, it, there's a large protein myth that uh, in fact uh, that where basically the world as a whole believes that uh, that if you don't eat some form of animal flesh, that you're not going to get the right protein. This has been debunked, I mean, many, many okay. years ago. So it really is a myth that um, just needs to be associated with now. Uh, you need to debunk it just like uh, as we start layering in the the effectiveness of uh, eating plant-based diets to, for our environment, we need to just remind everybody that, hey, by the way, you can get the right amount of protein from better protein, actually, from yeah. plant-based foods that are not inflammatory stressors that don't mm -hmm. contribute to disease, Western disease, and at the same time are going to uh, contribute to the healthiest possible uh, benefit for our, our planet. So it's just, I think it's just, they both have to go hand in hand. Yep, I agree. You, you write that we have 60 billion more animals on Earth than humans, so why, how, why is this an issue for the air that we breathe? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the the amount of you know you know, and I mentioned this before, the population growth. I mean, many people just blame resource inefficiencies on population, and it it, it is based on population, but not human population. It's based on how we're using our planet for our animals, because that those figures you just gave are very very stark. And so the, the primary reason that it, it's a problem really is more related to climate change. It's more related to uh, how much how much methane and carbon dioxide exchange and nitrogen and and actually also phosphorus. I mean, we probably should touch on that very quickly. It's a there's a phosphorus and nitrogen cycling issue that's becoming a problem. In fact, um, it's predicted that that we'll run out of phosphorus, which is a finite. Uh, resource. It's not. It's not renewable in our lifetime. So it's predicted we're going to run out of phosphorus probably in the next 20 or 30 years if things uh, continue the way they are now. And 72% of our footprint, our phosphorus footprint, is from animal agriculture. 
Mm. And so now moving back to the to the atmosphere, I mean, the largest concern is really, uh, even though there's pollution, and we can talk about that quite a bit, uh, it's mostly related today. The, most lar- the largest issue is really the effect on uh, our, our, uh, our atmospheric effect for climate change. Uh, mm. In fact, uh, that's one of our environs that, you know, we've just moved into the last 50 years into an era where humans have evolved, if you want to use that word, to where we can affect mostly, most, we can affect it positively, but mostly negatively the environs that sustain us, the litho, hydro, and atmosphere. And animal agriculture uh, is the largest contributor to the negative effect of all three. Mm. You know, all these wonderful things you're saying in the lectures you give, like, can people watch this? Is there a link? I mean, I think everybody needs to hear what you're saying, and not everybody's going to be listening to this podcast. Is Can people see you talking about this somewhere? Without yeah, me? well, yeah, absolutely, and that's a great question. And first of all, I want to I want to remark that I I would like to think everybody would listen to this podcast. <laughs> I mean, you have some you have some great things to right. present. But, 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 like that, but, but we do have yeah we we do have a website called my website's called comfortablyunaware.com and it'll lead you to just about everything. But also on YouTube, you can look up anything under um, Dr. Richard Openlander right. there. But go to the website. It'll it'll uh, and also uh, like us on Facebook. Uh, we have a comfortably unaware Facebook presence and Twitter presence, and uh, but especially on the website comfortablyunaware.com. I also have a nonprofit group that uh, uh, is called Inspire Awareness Now, and that website's just with a .org after it. And that will give quite a bit of information about uh, lectures and um, and uh, and also uh, just new information, new data, and but mostly most of that can be found on comfortablyunaware.com. You'd think that everybody would want to know this, but then, like you say, maybe if they knew, then they would have to change their behavior, so they would rather be unaware. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, that that is really uh, an important uh, comment, and I'll, and I can mention this about that. Uh, most people would consider themselves. I think the latest figure is between 65 and 72 percent. Most in America, anyway, most people consider themselves environmentalists. They'd want to do something to help the environment. Uh, it, but there was a recent study that was produced uh, that stated that, in, in fact, out of the three or four primary Western uh, countries, uh, that uh, less than 10% really knew any connection about food choice and the environment. And if they knew that about food choice and the environment, they would still do something about it. But the fact is, is that only three to seven percent of all the population in the world are vegetarians. So. Yeah. So you're exactly right. The first step comes from, with awareness. We have to we have to make people aware of this. And the second step is then um, we're hoping that they make that connection that hey, uh, once you know this, that you have to take it upon yourself to to make that change to a fully plant based diet, or um, you are yourself. And I you know I don't want to seem uh, harsh, but it becomes a matter of ethics. And I'm not talking about just ethics about animal uh, rights, okay? Because that's very important. But I'm talking about ethics, uh, about the way that you are deciding what you want to put on your plate and how it affects other species on Earth and all of our resources and future generations. You have to ask yourself, is this the ethical way to eat? And and I think everybody needs to, to find the answer quite easily by saying, um, the best, what's in the best interest of for myself, for our planet, and all species that inhabit it, and all future species that will inhabit Earth, is a fully plant-based, organically grown, whole plant-based diet. And once they say that, once they recognize that, uh, they can find so many different ways to eat uh, in a tasteful, delicious fashion. And I think it becomes quite easy that way. I eat just like everybody else. I mean, mm-hmm. I ate, I ate just meat and potato diet uh, up until 40 years ago. 42 years ago, and wow. um, and then I stopped. But you know, I, I stopped you know rather rather quickly once I started knowing everything about it. Sure. Um, I think, and I'm nothing special. I think everybody can do this. I think I'm giving a lot of people a lot of credit, but I think that they can do it. It doesn't take that much effort these were, days. Were you still in high school then? Because you, you're not that old. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you. I'm I'm 63 this year. So you do uh, not. Oh my yeah. God! I thought you were so much younger. So you were basically college. You were about college age. Yeah, I was. I was in college, yeah. So thank you, though, for that. I appreciate that. 
no, you, you look great. You would, well, all us vegans do, but you would think that any of the reasons that people choose to go vegan, whether it's animal welfare, human health, or the environment, each one is a great compelling reason. That would, that should be enough. But the fact that we could solve all three problems mm -hmm. with one decision, you would think it would be a no brainer, but I guess it's not. You it know, is. It is a no-brainer, but I want to tell you, those two other legs of the equation, they're so important about animal rights and welfare as well as, uh, as, well as your own human health. But at this point in time, as I said earlier, we have to look outside of self. Those other two are basically based on self. It's your self-awareness. Okay, we're going to have to start looking very soon, quickly today because of these tipping points, uh, at the environment because you're, you're, now, you're now not making decisions for yourself. You have to make decisions for all those around you and all the interconnectedness of life. So I, I think that has to take you know, top priority, and especially knowing that as we, as we move along, we are actually moving past these tipping points. We're creating irreversibility. Whereas, you know, for your own human health and for animal rights and welfare, they're very, very strong issues, no question. But, um, but we can't sit, we can't wait for everyone in the world to get around to, to recognizing that they need to do something for themselves, their own health, or for the animals that they're slaughtering, or for, and, and, and you know, we need to redefine a number of things like that, too, because, you know, when you're talking about looking out for animal welfare, it's actually, it's actually the welfare of all species on Earth. It's wildlife sure. as well as domesticated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are saying that you can raise grass-fed beef sustainably, but I, do you agree with that statement? Well, it's, it's, it, it's vastly wrong. I mean, you know, I, you know, I can go over a number of different reasons, but let's just say this. It's basically stated for the permaculturists and the grass-fed and the pastured uh, enthusiasts and, and the, to perpetuate the continuation of animal agriculture. And the best way to propose this is, is that it's actually less sustainable in a number of ways than factory farming. Uh, and, and, and you need to hold on to your seats when I say that, but it's very true because it, it usually requires between, between one and a half or two acres up to 40 acres to 50 acres to produce one cow. And, uh -huh. and, and a grass-fed cow will produce 60 to 70% more methane. And so from, a, from a, uh, a land efficiency standpoint and from a climate change greenhouse gas emissions, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions standpoint, it's much less efficient. Um, they're much more involved in global depletion than even factory farmed uh, animals. And still you don't get away from the slaughtering. It's, they may live a better life on the uh, grass-fed plains, but uh, there is no USDA regulations for, uh, for how, to, how, to, how to qualify the humane uh, act of slaughtering um, slaughtering these animals. And I've written about that in my last chapter, the last book. It's a huge section on how the USDA manages uh, the humane aspect. And so, so do a few others have written about it. But So no, it's not, it's not sustainable at all. I don't think there's anything humane about it. So. <laughs> of course. No, yeah. of course. So how does the grazing cattle lead to the soil erosion and desertification? How does mm -hmm. that happen? Well, it happens in a couple of different ways. I mean, the most obvious way is just, and this, this flies against what uh, Alan Savory and the, you know, the grass and pasture fed proponents will, will argue, but uh, basically it's a leading cause of, uh, of, uh, of um, deforestation and the subsequent erosion and desertification in tropical areas because, as I said before, the soil isn't really all that suited to cut down the trees. And, uh, and, and allow uh, livestock to trample them. And so basically it's from the hoof movement. Um, it's also from uh, the initial cutting down of, or deforestation, and then it changes. We could have microclimate changes, and then erosion usually occurs, and the, and the, the sequelae or the, the subsequent uh, erosion, usually then you'll have uh, desertification. And that desertification is a very, very significant issue. We're losing topsoil at a really large rate. Um, and it's predicted that all our topsoil will be gone in 60 years. Wow. Uh, and therefore, you know, I've already mentioned phosphorus and now mentioning topsoil. But again, the, 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 it's predicted that, that uh, at least one half to two thirds of all topsoil in, in many, many countries have been lost. And most of that has been due to deforestation related to cropland and for grazing and crops to feed them, just as we discussed in the Amazon area. Over 80% actually in the Amazon area. Uh, and 90% in the Brazilian uh, Atlantic coast has been due to uh, animal agriculture, specifically livestock and crops to feed them. And so then what ensues is erosion and then eventually desertification where all topsoil is lost. 
So is it mostly cows, though? Is that is it mostly? It is. It's yeah. It is. It's still cattle, uh, which is the most land inefficient uh, animal to raise. But uh, but now there's been a little bit of a shift, as I mentioned, because of China's large uh, large push towards uh, towards uh, pigs. They don't. They're not only consuming 60 percent of all the pigs in the world, but they're also uh, now uh, producing and consuming 60, soon to be 70 percent of all soy. Wow, crazy. You know, some people I've actually heard say that, that, that it's human overpopulation is the reason for global depletion. That's not true, though, correct? No, that's what we mentioned just a few minutes ago. I mean, right, it's, it's, there are very many. There's always somebody in every crowd, you know, every lecture that I will give that will ask the question, well, isn't or comment, isn't it that more, uh, Dr. Oblinger, is it more of a problem of, of, uh, of global overpopulation? And the answer, again, is, is no. Uh, of course, of course, when we were at, you know, one or two uh, billion people, we didn't have that. We had some, you know, an abundance of resources. Uh, but the issue is more how we're using our resources inefficiently. Uh, for instance, if you're, if you're looking at resource um, resource depletion in terms of efficiencies. I mean, you, you can you can produce five thousand to sixty thousand pounds of uh, of plant-based foods on one acre of land versus about three hundred pounds of animal products. And it requires, and it, while while at the same time you're producing uh, three to five tons of methane and carbon dioxide, and you're using up to one million to two million gallons of water, yeah. uh, just 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 for that uh, grass-fed cow. It's and so it's, it's astounding, really, is, is the lack of, you know, how inefficient this is. So if you're talking about how are we going to produce enough food to feed uh, 9.6 billion people by the year 2050, it, you, you, ha- you just have to look at the most efficient way to do it, which is we can only be plant-based foods. A good way to look at it is draw a little line. And you have plants growing on one side of the line on the left, and you have animals in the middle, and you have humans on the end. I mean... If you're growing, if you're using all your resources, they're all being pumped into these these plants, and then the plants are eaten by the by the by livestock, and then the livestock are using more resources, and then the livestock are then slaughtered to use more resources by slaughtering to to feed us a fraction, one eighteenth or or less of uh, a food that we could have had if we just cut animals out of the equation and don't forget that the food that we're that we're eating at the end the end result of the food the end, end of the equation is is less healthy for us it's a food that's implicated in 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 five of the most uh common cancers and and four of the top leading causes of uh, death and disease in western uh culture so it's it's just a re, you know sort of a preposterous yeah. proposal and it's not related to uh how many people there are in the world it just seems like a no-brainer. I mean, we kill the animals, and, and mm-hmm. the people that eat them, they end up killing the people. I mean, you know, indirectly right. from disease. You know, um, the great thing about raising plants, other than being, you know, more affordable and sustainable and um, efficient, is plants don't poop the way animals do. So how does the manure sewage from the animals contribute to all this uh, global yeah. soil pollution and water and the other use of our resources? G- great Great question, because, you know, one of the areas of global depletion, I mean, we can't really talk about all of them. I, I could, if you want to keep me on the line here for a yeah, few sure. few weeks, you know, I, I could talk about all of them. But one of them is pollution, so I'm glad you brought that back up. And I can summarize by saying that um, there's a figure that was thrown around by EarthSave in the past few years, John Robbins' group, but it's actually it's actually changed. We recalculated, and uh, in America, in the U.S., uh, there's 7 million pounds of, uh, of waste, feces and urine, produced per minute. By by livestock, wow. seven million pounds per minute, and it ranges anywhere from depending on calculations from 50 to 123 times more than the human population of our country. So, so that's one thing. And then uh, we've already talked about methane, which is has a global warming potential of 86 times what carbon dioxide is, and and uh, and animal agriculture is the leading cause in, of global uh, 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 methane production. And uh, so, and also the water water pollution. Um, y- y- there have been a number of studies by the EPA showing that uh, nearly every uh, inland waterway in the United States is polluted with some form uh, of a product that came from animal agriculture, which is also uh, also runs off into our oceans, and it's been the leading contributor to uh, to uh, dead zones, which are areas completely devoid of life in our oceans. There are right now uh, over 500 
dead zones in our oceans uh, and where no life can 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 grow at all. And it's uh, it's and this these numbers are uh, doubling about every decade. So um, so it's it's a very very uh, embarrassing situation that's occurring with with pollution, prim- primarily uh, again from animal agriculture. Yeah. You know, I became vegan almost 40 years ago for ethical reasons, and I stayed vegan for health reasons. And this environmental concern, you know, obviously, I'll be honest, it didn't enter into it for my decision. And of course, it's it's important. Do you think the problem is is it pe- people don't make the connection that easily because mm-hmm. an- animal agriculture is largely hidden, you know. Uh, Paul McCartney yeah. used to say that if slaughterhouses had windows, everybody would be vegetarian. But here I am in Los Angeles, and I don't know what's going on in the rainforest. And even if I did know, I, I, I can't make the connection that this is what's causing the – do you understand what I'm saying? Like, sure. it, it seems like as a layman, it, it doesn't – until you explained it to me, first of all, I didn't understand it or it made sense. Mm-hmm. But it, it seems like – and I'm fairly intelligent. It seems like how are other people going to make this mm-hmm. connection that what is on their breakfast, lunch, and dinner plate – is the problem with the environment. I think it's almost a leap that some people are just like, what? You know? Right. Well, you know, first of all, a couple of things. One is that you're, you're not fairly intelligent. You're very intelligent. So mm-hmm. bring, it, strikes home, it strikes home really the problem, though, because you're right. It's not it, – typically, typically if you don't have something everybody, – everybody really works from their own uh, microcosm. You know, they have this little sphere. I, I do, too, in many cases. I have to sit down every day somewhere at the end of the day or beginning of the day and say I've got to – stretch out and work outside of the microcosm that's in front of me. And, um, and so it's very, very difficult for most people to see the effect they have on something else in the world if it's not brought to them. And so this is, this is an awareness issue. So I think it's going to have to really, the, the change that you're, that you're inferring needs to, to take place that we've discussed about really has to be on a couple different levels. One is that we have to uh, uh, become more aware, seek awareness in terms of how our food is affecting other things in life. Because you're not going to see it out your back window. You're not. You're not going to see it out in your in your yard. But um, but the second part of that equation is is that I think it's inherent in those environmental groups and political groups, our our policymakers, our leaders, uh, the media, uh, and especially these environmental groups that we're entrusting to protect our environment. Um, it's inherent. With them or within them to to make this connection for us, and uh, you know within the you know the billions of dollars that are that are given each year, uh, either as subsidies or as for that we give to these environmental uh, groups or by the subsidies by uh, uh, our policymakers. Um, most of that, you know, all of that should be rearranged, first of all, into, trans, into awareness and then transitioning farms to the most efficient uh, farms possible, including, including fishing industries. And so until, until we have this combined effect of indiv- raised individual awareness, you know, there's only so much we can do on our own, as you, as you just stated. But mm-hmm. I think it's inherent to our leaders to, to, start, um, to, to start increasing awareness and eventually, uh, I know that we'll have to hit a point where there'll be a top-down approach. I mean, there'll, there'll have to be, and I, I hate to say that, but it'll be where uh, policies are enacted um, to, to uh, first minimize meat and once the resource connection is made. And once the connection is made, that uh, I think insurance companies will start making this connection a little bit better, that you know, they will give smoking discounts. Well, fairly soon they're going to be making the connection to, to uh, meat consumption, and they're going to be giving discounts uh, to those who do, do not consume animal products. And the same thing is going to have to happen in a top-down approach with our policymakers. They're going to have to make the connection that you know, it's not the two or three gallons of water that you're, you're going to save by brushing your teeth a little less with, with, with running, using, running water less or the two gallons per minute that you're going to save by taking uh, uh, your shower for less time, it's going to be the 1,500 gallons you're going to save per day by not eating any animal products. And mm-hmm. so sooner or later that's going to happen where there will be, I call it more of an eco or health risk tax, and that's what it's going to be. You can call it incentives if you want to go in the, you know, in the positive direction, but however you look at it, we will hit a point where there will be uh, legislation on top of the table for our, for our uh, policymakers that will say, you know, if we're running out of this type of resource, the, and, this is, and, and animal agriculture is using most of that resource, so we're going to have to tax those that are using that resource and taking it away from other, other individuals that are living their life uh, as efficiently as possible for our resources and as healthy as possible for those around them and for our planet. 
Well, that sounds fair to me. The thing that's so unfair, Dr. Openlander, is that things don't really cost in the marketplace their true cost. And, you know, there's no such thing as a dollar burger. And, you know, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's well, there is. You're, you're exactly right. And that's what I'm saying. There's going to have to be a point where this is going to be imposed on producers and consumers of, of animal products. It's going to have to be imposed. And no offense at all, I think, I think uh, is it David Simon that produced uh, Meatonomics? I mean, I think he's done a fantastic job to open the door uh, to uh, the uh, hidden cost of, uh, of meat. But let, let's face it, from a, from a health risk standpoint, you can, you can quantify, you can calculate uh, fairly well, I think, and we've, we have a couple of mathematicians that are working on this right now, uh, what the impact is, well, how many dollars you know, that, that are the hidden costs of eating meat on all of us as taxpayers because we're ultimately paying for the loss of productivity and for the increased health care costs. But from an environment standpoint, some of these resources are invaluable and they're irreplaceable. So you can't say that a Big Mac would cost uh, $5 more uh, if you calculated in the environmental devastation. It's infinitely more. You can't get back the 55 square feet of rainforest that were cut down to produce the one quarter pound burger that, that he's talking about. And so uh, where he's done a fantastic job is opening the door uh, to understand that there is a, a hidden cost of our meat, just like you're saying, that needs to be borne by all those producers and consumers. But let's let's get the stats, you know, correct. It's infinite. You know, the amount you can't replace uh, the uh, the the uh, the oceanic sea life right now in ecosystems that are that are becoming extinct. How do you how do you put a dollar amount on that? How do you put a dollar amount on 50,000 year old rainforests that are being cut down? You yeah. can't. You can't. So so you have to make the price of of those uh, just so exorbitant that nobody nobody can nobody can purchase it, and yeah. so you know that that's the way we need to go with this thing. In fact, um, it, it it needs to be, it will be done sooner or later because the at some point in time the generations that follow us will not will not put up. Uh, and I've said this a number of times: those that are consuming the most efficient foods. Uh, uh, that are looking out for uh, uh, the planetary needs and for future generations, they're not going to condone those that are, not, that are eating animals and using all the resources at 18 to 100 times the rate. That they are. They're not going to condone that. And so it's, it's going to be sort of like, uh, I firmly believe it's going to be 20, 30 years from now. It's going to be too late for a number of tipping points. But it's going to be just like smoking in public places. I mean, there's certain places that don't condone smoking because it's secondhand smoke. Sure. And at, and at the same time, you know, uh, that's precisely what's happening actually in a much larger, more significant scale in terms of sustainability to the person who's eating meat on the plate next to you when you sit down at a restaurant. They're, imp they're imposing – they're imposing – uh, loss of resources, irreplaceable resources on you. Right. I would love to see that happen, you know, like with smoking. I'm not sure it's still at the airport, but for a while there, they had these little, like, glass rooms. So anybody that smoked had a smoke in this glass room, and they had mm -hmm. to all breathe each other's smoke. Mm -hmm. I think that it would be great if we had that for people that eat animal products. If they can do it, they have to be on display in this glass little, you know, <laughs> enclosed container away from the rest of us. Yeah, but, great point, but the only thing that's that's difficult with that that hits home is just what you said a little bit earlier is that, you know, it's very difficult to see what's not really on your plate. So as we're, we're a secondhand smoker, where smokers can all fill up the room with their smoke until finally they realize what they're doing to each other. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to, to do that with your, with your uh, animal products that are being, uh, you know, carted in on your plate. It's very difficult to, to, to do that. Yeah, secondhand meat. So mm -hmm. you said that we're moving towards our sixth mass extinction. Is this inevitable? Well, we're already there. I mean, oh, that's one. That's one of the tipping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. inevitable. Yeah. So that's exactly right, and th th that's one of the tipping points that um, that needs to be at the forefront. That everybody really needs to understand that with every every single dish that's served uh, with meat, there 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 are resource inefficiencies that are occurring, and and species that are becoming extinct because of because of your or our collective food choices. And once again, um, it's, it's, uh, if, if everybody could change to a fully plant-based diet, we, we wouldn't be having the effect. I mean, the baseline, historic baseline used to be about four species per year that were becoming extinct. With, with uh, uh, that many or more, they're becoming discovered you know, in, in various areas like the Amazon and, and in our oceans. But at this stage, most concerned scientists are, are seeing where there's 1,000 to 10,000 times that, that rate 
um, so between you know 4,000 and 40,000 uh, species are becoming extinct each year. And again, the primary reason they'll list out you know six reasons such as uh, deforestation and land use inefficiencies and invasive species and climate change and things like that. But the major culprit, the, the 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 combined the running thread between all those is animal agriculture. You know, all these scientists that you're mentioning that are discovering these phenomenon statistics, are they plant based? I mean, are even though they're discovering, are they making the connection and doing what's necessary to correct it, or are they just reporting? You know, that's that you've got such great questions. I mean, that's <laughs> part of the that's part of the problem that I had that I encountered when I was or whenever whenever I met with any body of scientists. And with this last one, we had, as I said, so many leaders, international leaders of uh, of uh, the various groups. And that was the single largest issue I had when I walked away from that. Um, that it was very very clear that they were all. Uh, I, I often call it. We have to educate the educated. Yeah, because because yeah. that that's where everything starts. You know, all of our consultants that are that are influencing uh, change. In fact, we were going through this with uh, attempting to create this multi-dimensional model of sustainability in uh, of mine in uh, in uh, developing countries to, uh, to based with a nucleus of all plant-based foods. And it and it and it helps it helps all the indigenous people there uh, with their soil fertility helps with water and land preservation helps with human health it creates uh, uh economies for them so so there's so many different things affected with this but the fact is is that uh the policy makers involved and those that are funding these projects or could fund these projects are all influenced by the scientists uh and uh basically PhDs that that are not plant based and mm -hmm. so they're finding these these uh you know this stream of information but nobody's ever really collecting it making and m making it hit home with their own life because they can't they just can't get away from eating uh animals themselves many of them are starting to become this way but most of them are on still the less meat attitude it's oh. and, which which isn't as i said it's so subjective and it's not going to work Eating okay. local is not going to work. E eating less meat is not going to work. The Meatless Mondays is one of the largest uh, is one of the largest uh, issues with sustainability. Is because it's basically providing false justification for everyone in the world to to uh, use uh, resources inefficiently on six days of the week and just not you know and do the right thing on one day. And I've often 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 said that it's you know <laughs> if you're if you're uh, uh, if you're a proponent of eating uh, meatless on Mondays, what you're doing is you're basically saying that it's okay for me to pollute and and contribute to climate change and to my own ill health and use resources inefficiently on six days of the week. It's like saying just don't be an asshole on Monday. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't. <laughs> so when you say eating less meat isn't sustainable, is that because when people are eating less meat, they're really just eating less red meat and switching to chicken and fish, or it's just not going to help for people to cut down at all? It's got to be an all or nothing. Because I'm just, I mean, well, I want what you want, but I'm just thinking of people out there like, well, I can't give up my, you know, you know how they yeah. are. I can't give up my hot dog or whatever it is. No, you're right. So there are a couple different levels to that. I mean, okay, so let's let's split out what you just said a little bit. First of all, it's it's not efficient. It's it's not sustainable in the sense of uh, for two different reasons. One is that they are just making the switch to uh, chicken and fish, which again are still red meat in a way, and um, you know they just call it white, but it's essentially uh, it's essentially still. Uh, still uh, contributing to biodiversity loss. It's still contributing to inefficient use of our resources. It's still contributing to, especially fish, is contributing to, I mean, it, our oceans are 30% more acidic now and warmer and have more nitrogen uh, influx than, than any time uh, in the last uh, three, 30 million years. And, um, and at that time, 95% of all species in our oceans became extinct. And so we're we're on, we're already uh at the point where all these tipping points have been reached. So the issue is is that uh it's unsustainable as a subjective as a suggestive a subjective uh act because less what does less really mean? You know, I mean, I've often said in a number of lectures I give I give numbers and examples of what actually is lost in in an hour 
I mean, in terms of resource depletion and with 300, over 300 children that die from starvation. So, so less might mean that we have, you know, a few gallons less of water that's used and there might be 200, 200 children that die in the next hour from starvation versus 300. That's less. Um, yeah. but, it, but is that, is that what we want to strive for? No. I mean, we, we should be striving for no children dying. And, right. th- and therefore, we should be striving for the, you know, the most efficient way to use our resources. I mean, with, with, uh, with uh, over 77 percent of all coarse grain in the world right now is given to livestock, while these while these 350 ch- children per hour die uh, from starvation. Mm. So, so it's not sustainable. And the the other issue about that sustainability is not only is it subjective, but as I said, they're they're switching over, just switching it over to making the change over to chicken and fish, right. which is not sustainable. But also, you mentioned something quickly in there about, uh, yeah, sort of like the bar being raised is what you're getting around to. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, I, I agree wholeheartedly that I'd like to give humans more credit than that and raise the bar to where it should be and then f- and let them find ways to reach it rather than putting the bar lower than what it should be. Uh, our earth, their own health, and species – all suffer because we can't put the bar at a high enough level where where uh, uh, where they where it needs to be. We're putting it at a level that we're assuming that they can't you know they can reach, but they can't reach the higher level. Well, that's you know that's ridiculous. Uh, you know what? Why should we allow the planet and all those species on it to suffer because we are assuming that humans uh, can't reach the bar where it should be? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you did, I did. Yeah. Uh, and I yeah I think everybody can everybody has that ability to do that and I guess what I'm what I'm getting at is, is it's just like the physician creed I mean we we all know that physicians are are the probably the largest culprit of this that they they put the bar where their patients c- can reach which is whether it's whether it's age related you know this is what a normal 50 year old or 40 year old or 30 or 60 year old uh, normally would be well normal isn't healthy. So right. normal in America is not healthy. So they've got to put the bar much higher and where it should be for them to reach it in terms of their own health. Well, we have to do the same thing in terms of the environment. You know, we, do, we uh, so many species, including our own, are are dependent upon us to put the bar where it needs to be. Mm. Yeah. So I agree. I guess I agree with you. To summarize, I agree with you that mm. that superficially it seems like, hey, you know, these people, whatever it is, whatever your audience is. They're going to walk out of the room if you raise the bar too high, and so we've got to raise it delicately. Well, at least at least give them that that knowledge. At least tell sure. them here's where the bar should be, and yeah. you could you can put the onus on your not you, but your audience can put mm-hmm. the onus on themselves if they don't reach that. But at least give them that knowledge, you know. You know, so I, I'm against hunting. I was raised Orthodox Jew, and we don't hunt in our religion. I mean, they do eat meat, and I don't believe that the way they kill the cow is any more humane. But anyway, I was brought up, you don't hunt. And um, I have some family that lives in uh, Bucks County, PA, and they, and, they, and they give kids guns there when they're 12 years old and let them go okay. shoot deer. And, and, and sometimes they eat it, and sometimes they just mount it. And I said, well, you know, why do you do this? And they said, well, if we didn't shoot them, there'd be too many deer. And I've heard people say, well, if we didn't eat animals, there'd be too many animals. So how do you address that ridiculous statement? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, transitions, first of all, um, first of all, I feel bad that the 12-year-olds back back in that area are given guns instead of the knowledge. You know, they should be given knowledge of what the, what they're doing and actually what they're hurting and also about their food choices. And um, and so that's that's really sad. But I know that happens everywhere. It's just not in that community. But I, I think the the – you know the thought of how to transition is always there, and I've been on a number of committees to to, to look at this logically and also some tr- strategically and how to project this out. And there are very easy ways to to transition. No, n- we're not going to we're not going to the world as a whole is not going to stop eating animals today, but right. we should. And mm-hmm. so I, I think that you know the the the. the what will happen eventually is everything can transition very nicely. You know, we what, we can start transitioning cropland, first of all, and pasture land to start mitigating climate change. And we start reducing uh, the amount of, of animals that are produced. And the animals that are already produced, um, you know, it, the, the goal here, I think, is to not produce any more and not mm-hmm. to eat any more. And, and actually, our, it applied to our oceans, we, if we don't stop, you know, sort of create the cessation of, all commercial fishing, that 
th those species of fish that I mentioned, the over 1,000 species, will never come back correctly. So it's, there's no such thing as sustainable fishing right now in terms of commercial sustainable fishing. So That's once, a complete misnomer. Once this, because you, you had mentioned in your book that the major cause of the loss of biodiversity on the planet is from the raising of the lock, livestock and the overfishing of the ocean. So are you saying then, Dr. Oprah Leonard, that once the species is gone, it's gone, it doesn't come back? Yeah, I mean, you know, I would like to say you you were mentioning you're going to be 88 by the year I don't know, 2050 or something, but you know, <laughs> I'd like to think that you and I and a few others, you know, could could live, you know, into the next 2,000 years and we'd be able to see what could come back and what couldn't come back. But there are areas of our oceans right now in certain species that are below, they're actually below the one to five percent uh, level of their uh, historic stocks. And they, many scientists believe they will, they will never come back as we speak. And, and certainly these 1,000 to 10,000 times the background rate species that are becoming extinct each year, they're not going to come back I, most likely ever at all. I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not in a position to be able to say if somehow something could come back, uh, but they're extinct. They're, they're, going, they're extinct. And so I, that's like, I, I suppose, thinking that, you know, would, or uh, having the, the argument, would, would dinosaurs ever come back? But, I mean, the fact is, is that in, in our lifetime, in our lifetime, we are contributing uh, to massive extinctions that we have not seen before in 65 million years. And, and, and most of it is in rainforests and our oceans, uh, but it's also because of massive land uh, use changes because of livestock and crops that feed them. So whereas some of it's from uh, urban sprawl and some of it's just from overpopulation, you know, certainly it's not 100% from animal agriculture, but uh, the great preponderance is. And so those are the things that we, we are in a position to, to stop. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't think that we should live our lives to think that, you know, what are we going to do with the animals? You know, be concerned about the animals that are already produced for animal agriculture. I think we should be concerned about, uh, first of all, stopping and then let the industries work themselves out, have a transition. You know, I've interviewed a number of uh, dairy farms that have transitioned to organic vegetable and fruit and that's, grain farms, and they, they can do it. They have, the, they have the wherewithal to do it. They have the land. They just uh, need a little bit more uh, subsidies. They need a little bit more backing from our government, but they certainly need uh, the demand. They certainly need to have the scale of production, you know, to help reduce costs, and and move our country into the right uh, into the right position, and a lot of that will happen with us, you know, reverting this or circling back around to one of the comments I made earlier about the the USDA that's that's every five years has a chance to give gui dietary guidelines. Well, it's inherent to them to provide uh, those producers and consumers with the knowledge that it's about time that we take. Uh, 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 sustainability with our environment and our natural resources in the same light as our our, our own human health, or else. Yeah, I've often said that it, it really, you know, human health is so important. I know it's one of those three prongs you mentioned: human health, individual health, as well as animal welfare, and now the environment. But you know, I've often said, and it's very very true that, it, 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 and I don't want to undermine the human health aspect or the animal welfare aspect, but um, I've often said that it won't matter ultimately. Ultimately, it will not matter how healthy we are as an individual, individual if our planet isn't healthy. Absolutely, absolutely. So Lori wanted to know if you could give her and all of us any either online resources or links to gently educating friends who think they are helping the environment in some significant way by not eating CAFO, C-A-F-O, raised animals. And what she did is she wrote a little paragraph that she cut and pasted from the Organic Consumers Association of a claim where it says that beef produced by farmers who raise cattle on grass using rotational grazing methods that actually improve the environment, grass-fed is a healthy, sustainable, and readily available alternative to beef, beef produced by conventional factory farms. And so... Um, how, what, where can we go to refute that? Yeah, and this is from Lori, did you say? You know, Lori Masters, you, she loves you. She... <laughs> Lori Masters, she's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I love her. Right. I love her. Um, you know, th that's, a, that's a great question. And I think that um, in terms of how to, how to find the information related to that, first of all, um, I, I don't want to overplay my second book, but it really is a, a great resource for grass-fed, pasture-fed operations, and, mm -hmm. and it's, not, it's not that tedious. You can go just to that section of the book, but that book is uh, 
is food choice and sustainability. And really it explains really well, in fact, the subtitle is why buying local, eating less meat, and taking baby steps won't work. But they can go to the land section. It's cle cleanly laid out in terms of uh, water and oceans and fresh water and uh, land use inefficiencies and uh, food uh, and food um, choices as related to um, you know some of the trends, and so if they can find that very easily, and it will explain and lay it all out for them quite nicely. So I I would start there actually, and and have a much better grip on uh, the myths that are involved in grass fed or pasture fed livestock. Wow. So do we have a third book to look forward to? We do. <laughs> uh, we we do. Uh, I had to get over a few little hurdles myself. Um, not not myself individually, but um, I, I had a number of things uh, occurring with a really dear friend um, passing away recently, and a few other things occurring with our animal uh, rescue and sanctuary. But um, that I had to tend to. But I plan in the next um, year. I've already started writing, and uh, I think that uh, we'll have another one coming out soon. Things change so much. In this, I mean, the the essence, the basics of what what I'm talking about it will not change until we the world uh, actually uh, converts to a fully plant-based diet, organic, organically grown. In other words, bits and pieces of everything that I'm talking about will remain until uh, because we'll still be in this pseudo sustainable state. We won't be doing things efficiently, fully efficiently. Um, and I, I I like to use the word relative or optimal sustainability. And that's the way I think we need to start uh, defining the, that word sustainable as it relates to food choice. And so I think that the, my next writing and my next set of lectures are going to be pretty much um, uh, divulging more of what's occurring, especially with, with timelines. We all need to be, know these timelines because we need to be aware, uh, instead of just that there's global depletion, how much time do we have? And uh, And now there are many, many resources for this. Uh, you know, there's one reputable one is the uh, Global Footprint Network. Another one's the Stockholm Resilience Center. And, and, uh, and those both are making very profound statements with over 100 scientists in each that uh, with, with uh, a number of studies related to our environment and food choice that are, are uh, clearly stating that, uh, but again, they're, they don't want to make the full plunge in saying you have to eliminate it uh, because they'll lose their audience and probably funders. Mm -hmm. But they all are, have come to the conclusion that we have to eat much, much less meat, and um, and still it's subjective. But at least they're coming to that conclusion, whereas five years ago, and when I was writing my first book, uh, no organization was really saying this. Right. I, well, I, we want everyone to wake up, and everybody out there listening, please get Dr. Openlander's book, Comfortably Unaware of Food Choice and Sustainability, if not for yourself, but for people that need to really have this information. So last question I ask this to just about everybody I interview. Who has inspired you the most to do what you're doing? Well, you know, honestly, I, I could name so many different people that have inspired me, but I I have to I have to be really true to my heart and tell me that and tell you that uh, the one who has inspired me uh, the, the most uh, it has been my wife, wow. uh, and nice. uh, she's just brought a hugely new dimension. Uh, her name's Jill, and she's brought a hugely new dimension to my life. As I said, it started out more from a nutritional cellular level, nutritional uh, standpoint, and uh, but you know without the component of what these what these animals are really about, whether they're wildlife or domesticated or beneath the ocean or above, um, it really brought uh, a much clear, brought much clarity uh, to my life and, uh, and, uh, and, and brought a much deeper dimension to what I'm, what I'm doing with and the, re and the research I've been doing and discussions and lectures and writing with the environment. Well, thank you, Jill, because then without what Jill, we would not have you. So thank you. <laughs> So um, we're out of time, so please just once again tell our listeners how they can either get in touch with you, your work, look at your videos, your books, what, what are the best websites again? Yeah, thank you. Nice, very nice summary. I mean, I think that I'd start with comfortablyunaware.com, and, uh, and I'd also uh, – that would be a good, um, a good funneling point. And then I'd also uh, uh, link up to, you know, like us on Facebook, a Comfortably Unaware Facebook page, which is, has a great deal of information every day that's being posted, and Twitter. 
and we have a Twitter presence. And then also look on YouTube uh, because as you, as you uh, so nicely pointed out at the beginning or asked at the beginning, there are some very, very nice uh, uh, lectures uh, that are on YouTube. I think we have over a couple hundred of them now. But um, I look at the more recent ones. There's one that was uh, produced in New York City. Uh, that's about an hour long. Another one that I did for McDougal, but a whole bunch yeah, of yeah. Oh, the one you gave at McDougal was just—I just, I heard it made him cry. It was so good. <laughs> well, thank you. It was. Uh, that was just such a great lecture. I, I, I appreciate that. I really do, and I think that uh, there are a number of smaller versions, little segments out of more recent lectures that were things that data has changed a little bit, but they're little like two-minute, five-minute videos on YouTube. So I look all that up, and then. Um, and then if worse comes to worse, I, I would encourage anybody to write to me at uh, my inspireawarenessnow.org website or Comfortably Unaware website. I'd be happy to, uh, to answer any questions you might have. And uh, hopefully, um, look, look for me. I'll be back out lecturing uh, soon. Yes, please, um, please. You know, it's so funny, Dr. Openlander, I first heard of you in 2011 when I was staying with Linda Middlesworth, and she must have had 100 copies of your book, and she was, <laughs> um, she was giving them out to people, like, you know, people give out Halloween candy. <laughs> she gave me the book, and I read it, and I thought, oh, who's this Richard? Oh, who? And she <laughs> talked about you, like, and, and just, like, I'm like, what is going on? Who is this guy? And then, you know, once I met you, once I heard you speak, I understand what all her excitement was about, because you really do such a great job of focusing on one thing that's very important, but bringing everything into the conversation. And it's just so important that you, you, you don't leave one stone unturned of, of how everything affects everything. And it's like Chief Seattle said, you know, man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand and then everything he does to the strand, he does to himself. And that's really what your work is to me. You, you, you don't leave any species or the, I mean, everybody's included in your work. And, and I realize how important everything is to everything else. Well, I, you know, I can't thank you enough for that summary. I mean, you're so very kind and, and, and of course, Linda is just, I just love her and, uh, yep. And I love you. You guys are just well, really you. doing you're really doing wonderful things, and I can't thank you enough for for all of this. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's just been so enlightening. Just I can't wait to listen to this again and take more notes so that I can rebuke some of these things that that people say. Some of these stupid things, you know. <laughs> so, uh, we'll call it Doctor Openlander's snappy answers to stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope I've helped somewhere along the way because we we're all in this together. We can't reach the point of sustainability, you know, without all of us moving the critical mass. So I think it's just so important. And uh, so thank you so much. And thank you. And thank all of you for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Openlander. Thank you so very much. Good night. Good night.